I remember from COM 101, the first thing they teach you is that sensationalism and the glamorizing of the negativity, how that sells. However, I'm also a local resident of a local community that was just publicized quite greatly with a, a hate crime. And having been a community member, a teacher in that building, seeing the emotional response about the negative coverage and how that impacted the seniors, who I happen to be one of the class advisors, so I'm very close with many of the students. I'm still working out the process of how this is impacting our community. And I guess what I'm getting to is, do you feel that there's a responsibility or a bias towards communities where a one community, for example, is targeted again and again and again, and the only thing that's publicized is the negativity and perhaps the responsibility on the youth of that community and trying to rise above. And I know that that might mean nothing to anyone in this room, and I might sound very naive. But again, I have a personal connection that has caused me to look at this. And it's difficult to interpret the news as a consumer, an educator, and also a resident. And I'm in the mix myself. I got you. So let me answer this in a broad way. We deal with the subject of, is there too much bad news? And what's bad news? I shouldn't say this because my colleagues will be upset with me, but we took an Ann Murray song. Does anybody remember Ann Murray? That's so encouraging because when I ask the students, they all stare at me like I'm from another planet. We took an Ann Murray song that she did, All I Want Is A Little Good News. I don't know if you remember that story. She's a woman who wakes up each morning and all she gets is bad news. And we did our own MTV version of that and we filled up the screen with bad news images and we played the soundtrack. And we have the students think about whether there's too much bad news and is there, does the news media give us a skewed version of the world? And then we have them go to a newspaper and look at every story in one issue and decide what's bad news, what's good news, and what news they really can't determine. Or is there news that's good for some people and bad for other people to get that process? You know, is the nature of news that we're going to report a lot of conflict? And we do a lot of the news drivers. We choose 10 news drivers. What makes some information newsworthy? But these are good questions. We had a student, very quickly, who lived on a cul-de-sac on Long Island whose next door neighbor was murdered six months ago. He was a lawyer and he was found shot in the head at an Italian restaurant in the parking lot. And she came to me and she said, Professor Schneider, I'm a news literacy student. I may even want to go into journalism and I'm really rattled by this experience. Because I understand everything you told me in this course. The, the role of the news media, you want to get information, you have to empower people, your job is not to make the world pretty, it's not to make it pretty. We show them this slide from the Matrix, any of you see the Matrix where you can take a red pill or a blue pill? We take the red pill. We got to show people reality. And she said, I'm really shaken. People were hiding in the bushes, they jumped out and ambushed my family, they're taking photos day and night, what kind of press is this? How can I participate and be a reporter? And she struggled with this. And I said, how would you like to tell the whole lecture about your experiences? So she got up about two weeks later and described the tension she was feeling between understanding all of the principles we were talking about in this class and seeing the reality of the ground on how the press operates. And we had a long discussion. So we try to at least get those issues out on the table. Over here there. Howie. Yes, I'm sorry. How I, what do you think Dang. about about you, about shifting this so it would be taught at least parts of it would be taught to journalism students? How would how would you change the curriculum if you were to present it to journalism students, or do you think there's a value in doing so? We require all of our journalism students to take this as a prerequisite. So 90% of the students who take this are not journalism students, but we require it. We think it's a baseline for every journalism student. So I would require it of all journalism students. I would not change the curriculum radically just for journalism students. I think it's very valuable to have journalism students, future journalists, in the room with future consumers, by the way. I think that's very valuable as well for people to understand that. A anybody else? Yeah, I was here. Okay. Could you stand up? Hi. Hi. My question is really going towards institutional buy-in of this. First of all, I have two questions. Are your students taking this as an elective or as a requirement? Because if you have thousands of students taking it at a university level, that really requires a broad-based support level, especially in terms of general electives. Second question is how do you structure the class? You mentioned large uh, lecture halls and then break out into groups. Can you elaborate on how sure. you structure sure. that? Sure. So sir, first, the first part. So I'll have a confession here and the president's sitting here. So when I came here, I was pretty naive about academia. That's a shock. And uh, so I said, well, this is a great course. I'm going to go to the curriculum committee. I'm going to ask the committee to mandate it for every student on campus. <laughs> Why not? 
you know? Bill is laughing because he knows what that's like. And they said, wait a second, you are just here and you want to take one of your courses and make every student take it? What are you, out of your mind, etc." And we described the course, we described the grant. One of the reasons Knight gave us money to teach so many students is that we want to see if this works on a very broad-based student. We don't want self-selection. We have a lot of students take the course because it fits their schedule. I'm going to tell you how it fits some requirements. And so we want thousands. And if we're going to test this and come back with data in two years on whether it makes a difference, you want lots of students. So finally, we reached this compromise. They did not mandate the course, but they did agree. What we have at Stony Brook is 15 required course categories, general education requirements. You probably have the same thing. Students have to take certain general education requirements. Within those core categories, there are multiple choices they can take. The curriculum committee made this the first course in the university history that would be in two of the most popular categories. So as an incentive to get lots of students to take the course, they put them in both. So when they take the course, it satisfies a general education requirement. They don't have to take it, but it does. And the way we organize the course right now is we have these lectures once a week, and this is very typical, and we're grappling, is this even the best way to do it? But if you're going to teach 1,000 students a semester, you've got to deal with orders of magnitude. And we then have an hour and 20 minutes lecture, very interactive lecture, a lot of multimedia slides, a lot of talking, trying to engage the students, and then we break out into groups of 25 or 30 once a week. And we follow up the lecture, get the students talking about these issues, getting them engaged as much as, much as possible, follow up, etc. So that's how we're organized. Within that group, we break them even into smaller groups. So we'll have a smaller group within the small group work on the front page. Or we'll have a smaller group do something else, okay, have this trial. So we do as much as we can. I think, where's Marcy? Here. You're the timekeeper. How many more questions? One more question. One more question. Anybody? I got it. Way in the back? Oh, oh we have one here. Two I'm more sorry. questions. Go Two ahead. More questions. Two more questions. We'll get to you. <laughs> Howie, the, the stuff I'm seeing here is really fantastic. I think uh, it's, it's really wonderful. The one uh, piece that I think some people have already picked up on that may be missing is it seems to me from looking at the press for a long time that journalists are pretty careful about right-left bias, which is the usual kind of bias that um, is spoken of. But I think the overwhelming problem in the press, particularly now as resources are being drained from the most important news media, the newspapers, is commercial bias. And it seems to me like, well, I'm glad you got question. one section, one class on that. Um, but I wonder if, if that may be something that you'd expand even further, because that, I think, is the most serious problem plaguing the press. Can you just define the commercial bias for me? Yeah, I'd say commercial bias is um, an orientation in news, selecting events and issues for news based on commercial rather than... Selling, um, ratings, etc. Um, yeah, that's one thing, but also, for example, selecting stories that appeal to particular demographics, um, saving right. money on reporting by recycling press releases as news. There are a lot of heads to this hydra, um, and I think that ought to be, with all due respect, a greater um, orientation in the class. Absolutely accepted. I think this course, as I said, is a work in progress. One of the things that I'm excited about is getting a lot of your eyes on this to give us ideas on how to make it better. One more question? Yes. Uh, Howie. Uh, Larry, how a, are you? A blast Stand from up, your Larry. glorious past. Mm -hmm. um, how, has any thought been given to uh, uh, the ability, uh, the practicality of exporting uh, this to other universities? If, say, uh, well, Hofstra University uh, decided, uh, agreed with me that this was uh, uh, a wonderful thing that all Hofstra students should take, and that it's not worth reinventing what looks like a pretty good wheel to me, what, what is the, the problem, what would be the obstacles in exporting this to another university in real time? Not a lot. Uh, so we have the Center of News Literacy was created as a vehicle to do that. And over time, we'll talk more about the Center, and at Friday I hope to have some action plans. We're also going to hear from another university who's going to make an announcement today, right Marcy? We have another yes. university making an announcement today that they're about to undertake a program just like this. And we're going to share everything we're doing, and they're going to share with us, and the center will be the clearinghouse and the vehicle. So the short answer is nothing is standing in our way. Okay? I want to thank you very much, and we're going to...